Are you ready for the word? Yeah. Let's stand to our feet as we read the scripture together. And I uh, heard Pastor Daniel preach great last weekend. Yeah. I was listening to him. And, on you know, if you have an iPhone or a Droid, we have a free app you can download. And you can watch live stream wherever you are. So if you want to just sit kind of like on the beach and watch me preach, you can stay at home, watch. It's not two-way, so I can't see you. So it's, it's all good. Watch, watch wherever you want to watch. So it's, it's all good. <laughs> anyway, let's keep going. All right. First Corinthians chapter 15. And let's get into the scripture. The scriptures tell us. Somebody say, the scriptures tell us. Stop. Your life as a follower of Jesus should be led by the scriptures telling you. I'm not interested in what the world is saying, what popular media is saying. I want to know, come on, what the scriptures tell us. Scriptures tell us this, that the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is what? Come on, everybody. That is? Everybody in the back, help me. That is? No, not the front. Everybody in the back, that is? Christ is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is a natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man or second Adam, came from heaven. I want to talk to you in the series, Jesus, who do you say that I am? I want to talk to you about Jesus, the last Adam. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the greatest 10 o'clock experience I've ever preached to you right now. Open up our hearts and lives, and thank you for everybody online, OC, every campus that we have, especially the Maui campus. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much, Jonathan. In this series, we're exploring what the Bible says about Jesus and who Jesus is. And today I want to talk to you about Jesus, the last Adam. I am a father, married. I have three kids. I have a 13-year-old son named Benjamin Jesse Perez. He goes by BJ. I have a nine-year-old daughter, and by the way, BJ is the brainiac in the family. He is a walking encyclopedia That statement I just made is for those of you that are over 40 years of age. He is a walking Google. Come on, somebody who's younger. He just comes in with random information. Like this morning, we're getting ready. My little daughter has a fish. And I said, do you remember to feed the fish? Of course, she did not remember to feed the fish. I don't even know why I got her a fish because they said it's better than a dog, but that fish is going to die like the dog was dying because they never feed the fish or feed the dog. And so my son says, hey, Dad, do you know there's a fish that has no eyes? He starts going on this trail. BJ, it's 8.15. I don't care about a blind fish. He's the brainiac. Anybody have a kid like that? Yeah. I have a daughter who's nine years old. Her name is Bella. Bella is my favorite girl in the family. I only have one daughter. And she's just kind, sweet, loving. She's not really aggressive at all. And uh, yesterday, last night, she made my night as she was coloring something on the table, and I'm watching Flipping Vegas, and, uh, and she just came and sat next to me, put her head on my shoulder, and cuddled with me with a blanket. Usually, I'm calling her over, but she just did it instinctively, and in my heart, I was saying, whatever you ask for, it is yours. <laughs> I just didn't let that come out of my mouth. <laughs> Thus, I still have money. Then I have my six-year-old, and his name is Benaya. Benaya is active. He is busy. He is curious. He's wild. And so his life is always interesting. He always has things to tell me about his older brother and older sister. Tells me all their junk and all their stuff. Tells me where they're hiding things. And I go bust the little candies underneath the bed. So what we do at the Perez household, we do this. 
I would say, you know, three or four days a week, depending upon my schedule. Uh, we do a thing right as they're going to bed called Bible quiz. Anybody did Bible quiz when you were young? Okay, nobody. It must have been all in church heathens. Fantastic. <laughs> but Bible quiz is where I start asking them questions about the Bible. So, for instance, I would say, uh, and, and, and the way we do it at our house is that you can't just blurt out the answer. If you blurt out the answer, you, you get discipline, okay, and uh, five lashes or something <laughs> that nature, uh, spit what through the face or something. And so you got to raise your hand, right? And so the Bible quiz would go something like this. Um, and we're going to play Bible quiz here. So I see some children here. they got a great children's ministry. I'm, I'm really boring. Over there is really good. You should try it. And, and I'm, I'm with you. I like that little girl. She's with me right there. Fantastic, okay? Uh, so let's do Bible quiz, okay? So I got some kids here. I love kids because kids are kind of engaging. You over there anyway. But you know, I mean, I'm just going to preach to them. They just like seem alive. They're actually smiling. So who built the ark? I see that hand, the little girl with the black. Who was it? You don't know. Who was it? Noah. She is right. Give her a big hand clap. Um, who got the Ten Commandments from God? Hand. Hand. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Moses. Give her a big hand clap. That's fantastic. Okay, so, so you're getting the feel of this, right? Now, if you were a Perez... You would now, the first one that gets five questions right gets to five points, you win a prize. My son Benaya knows this, so every time I say Bible quiz, he says, how much is this for? <laughs> he doesn't care really about the knowledge he's acquiring. He just wants the money that he's going to spend. Okay? So that's the way it is. And so my son, because he's at a disadvantage, because the older kid, the brainiac, <laughs> just ask him, he knows. Okay? Who was the sixth son, the sixth son of Obed-Edom? Here it is. I'm like, Jesus, help me. So my son, Benaiah, because usually he's slow with his hand, when I start asking a question, his default mode, his default answer is always Joseph. <laughs> I don't know why. It's just, it's a, it's a family joke now. And I'll go, jo and when I go okay, Bible, Joseph, hi. <laughs> and everybody starts laughing. It's just funny. So, you know, most of the questions, the answer isn't Joseph. And he, he, one time he was crying because, Dad, I never get the answer right. So I said, okay, well, I'm the game guy. Come on, Hunger Games. I'm the one who's going to do this. So I said, um, who is the father of Jesus? <laughs> Joseph, you're right, Benaiah. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, Dad, that's easy. I said, okay. Who... who uh, was thrown into a pit, throws up his hand. Joseph, you're right. Joseph's brothers threw him into a pit. Who got their jacket torn off by a desperate housewife? <laughs> Come on, somebody. You never saw that show, Desperate Housewives of Egypt? <laughs> he throws up his hand. Joseph, yes, you're right. You know, and, and so all the answers were Joseph. <laughs> the other kids were like, so, so I, I, I said, okay, who was the brother of? BJ raised his hand. Joseph. I said, no. It was James, the brother of Jesus. <laughs> and little Benaiah is like, ha, 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 brainiac, you're dead, you're down. <laughs> you know, it's just what kids do, right? That's how kids operate, right? Now, if you're in Bible quiz, and if you happen to get who built the ark, and you say it's Moses, it's not going to really hurt you that bad. Who had the Ten Commandments? Noah. It's not going to really mess you up that bad. Who called fire down on heaven, you know, from heaven? David. No, he was with the sling. It's okay. It's all good. But what I'm about to preach to you is so important that if you don't get what I'm about to teach you in the next 20 minutes, you can miss the whole Bible. Because there's many great characters in the Bible, but actually, there are two main characters, of course, Jesus being the main character, but there are two, actually, people in the Bible, and both of them are called Adam. 
There is the first Adam. We read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that it talks about the first Adam. He was created from the dust. This is Adam and Eve when God put him in this incredible garden. And this garden was an incredible blessing. And then out of his side came this woman named Eve. And that was a glorious day. He wakes up and there's his bride there. And, and so that's the first Adam. But in 1 uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 15, it actually says that there is another Adam. That he's the last Adam. And his name is Jesus. Most people don't know that that's actually in the Bible. Let me go a little bit further. When God looks at humanity, he only sees two groups of people. He sees people that are in the first Adam, and he sees people that are in the second Adam or in Jesus. Life is simple because there's only two categories. This is not 31 flavors. This is not some yogurt place that you get to put all kinds of toppings on. When you look at the Bible and Jesus looks and God looks at humanity, there are only two groups, those that are in the first Adam and those that are in the second Adam. And the Bible actually makes this very clear. Now, why is this important? Because when I begin to teach this, light bulbs are going to go off. Because we don't quite understand what it means that we're in the first Adam and what it means that we're in Christ or the second Adam. So let's grab our Bibles. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We're going to begin at verse 12. Now, I want to do a Bible study. Somebody say Bible study. Those two words are not opposed to each other. What we like is Bible information. Bible information is good, but Bible information does not bring transformation. Bible knowledge is good, but it doesn't bring about life change. The Bible, when it is studied and God reveals his truth to you, then it changes the way you live. Are you hearing me? Okay. So let's read the Bible together. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. And as we read, I'm going to stop, interject some things, and hopefully by the time it's over, in the next 20 minutes, that we will have learned something significant. Please put it up. The Bible says, when Adam sinned, which Adam is this? Everybody say first one. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought what? Say louder, brought what? Death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. Now stop. What's he talking about? He's talking about the law of Moses. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. Rent it later. Charlton Heston will go up into a mountain, and he'll get these commandments and bring them down. By the way, I can't wait till next year. Because now Russell Crowe, come on, is playing Noah. Yeah. So, yes, people sinned even before the law was given. But now look at what the Bible says. But it was not, look at Chip, it was not counted as sin. Because there was not yet any law to break. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 14. Still everyone what? From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now stop. We're going to stop here and talk. So what's happening here is that Paul is being used by the Holy Spirit to explain to us the scope and the width and the really the timeline of what we know as salvation. What we know as the beginning of time to when Christ came. That everything is wrapped up in the first Adam and the last Adam. That there now is a difference between the first Adam and the last Adam. The last Adam, because he sinned, go back one verse, please. I'll go back to verse 13. I'll go back to the other verse, verse 12, please, and then put it up there. He said, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Now, here's what happened. Adam's sin brings death. So when Adam was put into this perfect garden. God said, I don't want you to eat of this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of this tree, you shall die. 
Now, what happened is that God gave them everything in abundance, but kept one thing to himself. And all Adam had to do was enjoy everything God had given him and begin to magnify God's provision. But the devil came in and magnified God's prohibition, that which you could not do. And so the devil came to Adam and said, Adam, if you eat of this tree, you're going to become like God. Stop. They already were like God. Satan cannot give you something that God has already given to you. So what Satan was doing was lying to him and implicitly telling him that God is holding something out from you, that God is not giving you his very best, that God has an agenda, and that agenda is not for you, but is against you. He is now undercutting the character of God. I got news for you, my friend. Sin will never fulfill you. Only God and what he has done will fulfill your life. I hear this all the time. Well, if I just get that guy, if I'm just with that woman, if I just have more money, if I just have more success. Listen, you were not created to be fulfilled by creation. You were only created to be fulfilled by the creator. There is no man on the planet, lady, that can make you happy in your marriage. There is no woman that can make me happy in my marriage. Because another person cannot complete you. If you're not married, oh, man, I just want to get married because when I get married, everything's going to be okay. Wrong. Hate to pop your bubble. But that person you're marrying will be moody one day. Okay, let me talk to the real people over here. That person you marry will wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Okay, let me try this section over here. That woman, when you wake up, with no makeup, I won't go there. Well, Pastor, you married her for what's inside. I know, but why is she covering up the outside? I'm just saying. (laughs) What we have built is this mythology about marriage. Marriage is incredible. Marriage is awesome. It, the intimacy in marriage is wonderful, my friend, but I'm here to tell you, if you think it's going to be a fairy tale with a knight with shining armor coming to rescue you, you got the wrong man. He already came. His name is Jesus. He already rescued you. He's already made you complete. You don't need a man. You don't need a woman. You are a complete somebody in Christ Jesus. And I love being married. I mean, I love being married, my kids and my wife, and and, and I love all that. But the problem is, is that now Satan began to somehow uh, get Adam to believe that he had to do something to get what God has given him already. Sin will never be satisfied in your life. So what happens is he takes of the tree, the Bible says, and he eats it. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. So when Adam sinned now... Sin enters creation. Now watch what the Bible said. It said, from Adam to Moses, there was no law given. The Ten Commandments weren't given yet. So even though from Adam to Moses, people sinned, it was not counted against them as sin because there was no law to break. So you would say, well, if it's not counted against them, then why are these sinners? Because Adam sinned, and his sin was now counted in their account. It was given to all those people. When the law came, now the law was given, and every one of us have broken the law. And so now, not only because of Adam's sin are we sinners, but because we have sinned ourselves. This is what the Bible teaches. And so the first Adam, because of his sin, he brought death, and death spread to everyone, and everyone has sinned. When you go to the next verse, verse 13, we begin to see now that now people sinned before the law was given. It was not counted against them. Next one, please, verse 14. Still everyone died 
from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who didn't disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Verse 15. Now, Adam is what? Say it louder. Is it what? A representation of what? Who was yet to come. Now, next verse. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin, come on somebody, and God's gracious gift. For the sin of one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. Keep going. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to, led to what? But watch, God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. So here, let's, let's break it down. The first Adam, watch me now. He blew it, sin entered, death entered, separation from God entered, and now from Adam to Moses, they were sinning. It wasn't counted against them, but Adam's sin was counted against them. Moses' law comes. Now everybody has broken the law, so everyone now has sinned, not just because of Adam, but because of their sin. And from Adam all the way to the second Adam, Jesus we now had to try and do something to make ourselves right with God. Thus, we have the sacrifices in the Old Testament. Thus, you had to sacrifice a lamb. You had to bring a pigeon. You have to do something, and it would just cover your sin for that year. But you had to do it over and over and over again. It was performance. You got to keep doing the right thing. And if you do the right thing, God will accept you. My friends, that is in the first Adam. But when the second Adam came, the second Adam, through his obedience, through his righteousness, you and me are now made right with God, not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. So now it's not about us doing it, but the second Adam has done it. Keep reading with me in the scriptures, please. And it says this, come on, thank you, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of what? And his gift of what? Now, for all who will earn it will live in triumph over sin. For all who will qualify for it, for all who will do uh, light candles for it, pray to statues for it, serve in church for it, amen, Pastor Benny for it. No, for all who what? Receive. You only receive. Go back to the next verse. Go backwards, Cassie, please. Watch me. It is a gift. What does the word righteousness mean? It means you are now in right standing with God. That now Jesus, because of his gift of righteousness. Now, wait a second, Pastor. I still and I do things wrong. That does not nullify the righteousness of God that was given to you by Jesus. Can okay, let me say it to you this way. You can be in Adam. All of us are. Everybody's born in the first Adam. Only two categories God looks at. In the first Adam, in the second Adam, which is in Jesus. So in the first Adam... Because Adam sinned, now we are sinners. You can do good things, be a good person, but that does not make you right with God. Now watch this. If you're in Jesus, because of Jesus and because he obeyed, because he fulfilled the law, because he was righteous and he died on the cross, now when you receive that gift of grace and the gift of righteousness, you are made right with God as if you've never sinned. Now watch this. Because you're in Jesus doesn't mean you won't sin. It means if you sin, it doesn't make you a sinner. Okay, let's go this way. Okay, you got to think for a little bit. Think. Because we think if I've sinned, I'm a sinner. No, if you've sinned in Jesus, you've sinned, but it doesn't make you a sinner. You are a saint who sometimes sins. If you don't understand this, the devil comes to you and says, if you really were a Christian, if you were really walking with Jesus, you want to flip that person off. 
Was that too close to home? If you were really a Christian, you would have looked at that magazine. If you were really, am I the only one that hears this? What the devil is trying to do is get you to question your position. Positionally, you are made righteous because of what Jesus has done. So what you do does not take away what he has done. Let me tell you this way. Adam ruined us. Jesus rescued us. Okay, I'll try that again. Adam ruined us. Come on, somebody. But Jesus rescued us. Okay, let's keep reading because we, 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 we got we to gotta keep seeing the scripture here. And, and the next verse is verse 18. For all who receive, okay, go back. For all, go back, I'm sorry. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Right? Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for what? Everyone means what? I looked it up in the Greek. It means everyone. Look at your neighbor. He says he's talking about you. Look at your other neighbor and say, I know he's talking about you. Just tell him that right now. For everyone, watch this, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for No, pastor, come on. You can't be serious. Because of one man's disobedience, we all became sinners. How is that fair? Well, finish reading the scripture. But because of another person, the second Adam's obedience, you can be made righteous. You see what the Bible teaches? The Bible teaches this is not on you. That now by faith, because of God's grace, it's a free gift that you turn and you receive it. And you say, Jesus, thank you that you made me righteous. Thank you that you've made me holy. Thank you that you have have given me right standing with God the Father because of what you did. Come on, somebody, on the cross over 2,000 years ago. God's law. People say, Pastor, we need to preach the Ten Commandments. We need to preach because the Ten Commandments are going to help people. Okay, let's see what the Bible says about that. God's law was given so all people can be free. I want you to read with me. Ready? One, two, three. God's law. Okay, stop. The word all means all. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. God's law given so that see how stop. The purpose of the law was not to make you holy, to make you right, to make you just. It was to show you and me how sinful I really was. The law has no power to deliver you. It has the power to indict you, but has no power to deliver you. I don't want to be under a system that just indicts me when there is no way to get out of that indictment. But we are under a greater system. But as people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. Verse 21. And what is the result of that? So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead. Giving us what? Giving us what? with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now, stop. You can get Moses wrong. Not a big deal. Get David wrong. Not a big deal. Joseph, get that wrong. Not a big deal. But here is where a lot of us have gotten it wrong. We've gotten the first Adam wrong and the second Adam wrong, and because we've gotten those two things wrong, we begin to believe wrong. And when you begin to believe wrong, you live wrong. Right believing leads to right behavior, right living. So here's what the Bible teaches. The first Adam lost it all. The second Adam, Christ, gained it all back and even more. The law was given to point to you and to me how sinful I really am. 
has no power to save me, deliver me, make me holy. It points out my flaws. What is the law given for? So I will come to the end of myself and actually turn and say, I need a Savior. Jesus now dealt with the law, and he says, you've heard it said, you should not commit adultery. This is in the, this is in the book of Matthew. And the Pharisees are sitting there like, that's right, that's right, not committed adultery. You know, you, the law says, Jesus said that you should not murder. All the Pharisees, self-righteous people are like, yep, that's right. Don't do adultery, don't do murder, not like those other people. Then Jesus said, but I say unto you, if you look upon a woman and lust after her, you've committed adultery. Ooh, all those Pharisees are like. <laughs> Remember that lady that came to the temple? <laughs> With that tight tunic on? Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, they wouldn't have said, oh, Jesus. Oh, Jehovah. <laughs> Oh, but, but I didn't sleep with her. She said, if you, if you hate somebody, you've committed murder in your heart. You know who the Pharisees hated? Jesus. He was indicting them. Because they're self-righteous people that what we do is we find other people that are more unrighteous than us. I've never heard anybody say, man, Mother Teresa, I'm holier than her. You know, people say, I'm not like that drug addict. I'm not like my brother. I'm not like that person. Ooh, do you know what that uh, housewife did? Ooh, I'm not like her. I know what some of you are thinking. Sounds like we do whatever we want to do. That's not what I said. What Jesus is trying to communicate is, is that sin has dominion over you when you think you could actually control it in your life. Wow. Okay. I'm going to go down this road. I take off my glasses so I'm not looking. In fact, I'm going to talk to the little light again. <laughs> see, this light, you can't see it because it's off. This is the first Adam. The glory of God departed from him. He had no relationship with God anymore because he disobeyed. He was full of pride and self-centeredness. Jesus comes and his light is shining and never goes dim because he obeyed God. And by his obedience, by his righteous living, we are, made, we are now made righteous before God. It's not by what you do. It's by what he has done. Now, the answer, the question comes to me and says, well, pastor, does it matter how we live then? And the answer to that question is, yes, it does. You're not living to be loved. You are living because you are loved. So now, when you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and it says, the Scriptures tell us how to live. The Scriptures, there it is. Thank you, Cassie. It says, the Scriptures tell us. Now... My role is to show you the Scripture, and the Holy Spirit, because you're a new creation, begins to direct you out of a lifestyle that is contrary to what Jesus would want in your life. Okay, let me go here. You take that off the screen. If you sin and you steal something, that sin is forgiven but the consequences of that sin will still be dealt. Okay? I could go crazy because this is Vegas and go to, uh, what are some of the strip clubs called? Okay. <laughs> Cheetahs. Sapphire, hustle, hustle, yeah, it's great, yeah. Pastor, you're just coming out with all those real fast. <laughs> crazy horse, <laughs> that's crazy, crazy, anyway, I can go and have some naked lady do a lap dance on me after she's lap danced another guy, which is crazy. 
I, I can do that. That does not take away my righteousness. I have sinned, but I am not a sinner, though I have sinned. Walk, work, work with me. I am made righteous because of what Jesus has done. I'm not unrighteous because of what I have done. But I can now indulge in that, and what will eventually happen is my marriage will be ruined. I cannot now be a leader in the church because I have to live a life above board. This scripture is very clear on that. And now, watch me, even though I'm forgiven, even though God looks at me through the shed blood of his son, I now, according to James, have to go and make it right. Confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. It never says to confess your sins to God. Confess your sins. I got to go to my wife, said, baby, I've sinned. I did this. I need to make it right with you. You see, why is that? Because with God, the shed blood of Christ has made me right. But because of people, we need to make it right and keep short accounts with people. But I'm not living under condemnation. Because if I choose to live under condemnation and the devil says, see that? Look at what you're doing. You're not really a pastor. You're not really a leader. You're a sinner. You're a phony. You're a fake. And the more I listen to that, the more I will lose hope and give up and turn to a reprobate and live a life that's crazy and wild because I've listened to the lie. But what do you do, Pastor, when you blow it? Here's what the Bible teaches. You see that sin? You say, this is what we do. Okay, let me just get down where we live in Vegas. You drink too much, and you hate yourself for doing it. Okay, it's going to get quieter. You go to a website that you shouldn't go to. You navigate all the protections, all the safety devices, all that stuff, and you're there viewing naked people, okay? And you're like, oh, I hate myself, okay? That's why parents, you know, I'm, I'm, I, in my mindset, I'm preaching to adults, okay? So this is not G. Disney. That's over there. This is R. <laughs> Restricted. We hate ourselves when we're caught in habitual sin. And what we do is we say this, don't we? I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to do it again. What we do is we stay focused on the sin. The devil wants you to stay focused on the sin because he knows if you will turn to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of your faith, that sin loses its grip on you, and you begin to understand, come on, the grace, come on, that is found, come on, somebody, in Christ Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. You see, Pastor, how many times do I have to turn? The more you turn, the less power it has. It's walking in the second Adam. That I am now the righteousness of God. Come on, somebody in Christ Jesus. I am a son. Come on, I'm a daughter of God. And nothing can change that. What shall separate you from the love of God? Romans chapter 8 says. Pastor, sounds like you're downplaying sin. No, sin is destructive. Sin will kill you. Sin will ruin you. The consequences are horrible. But my friends... The payment was paid. When you turn to Christ, he forgives all your sins. Let me tell you something. Past, present, and future. He only forgives the sins I confess. You want to live that way? I think you missed one or two. Even the Pharisees in this room have missed at least one or two. So let me teach you what the Bible says. If you die in sin, your soul shall die. In other words, you won't go to heaven. Because in heaven, there cannot be any sin. So for those of us that want to qualify still by our righteous living, you have not confessed every one of your sins. Because there's sins of omission and sins of commission. Now, that's, I'm preaching better than you were saying amen. I think some little lawgivers out there are like, oh, man. Oh. 
I'm going to keep knocking down these little pillars that you have. Because because by your law keeping, you nullify the grace that God freely gives to you. This is super abounding. See, that's why the Father, I'm closing early, says there's only two Adams I look at. The first Adam and the second Adam. The first Adam, watch me, he was living in perfect creation. And what does he do? He disobeys God. The second Adam goes into a wild wilderness and is tempted by the devil, just like the first Adam, and obeys God. The first Adam was, was, was created and formed on the sixth day. That's the first Adam in the garden. The second Adam, Jesus, died on the sixth day and entered into new creation. The first Adam, my friends, watch me, disobeyed with a tree. The second Adam, Jesus, obeyed by dying on a tree. The first Adam, my friends, threw the whole world into sin. The second Adam, my friend, brought the whole world into righteousness for all those who would believe. The first Adam goes to sleep, wakes up, and what's by his side, comes out of his side, is a bride named Eve. The second Adam named Jesus goes to sleep on the cross, and what comes out of his side, blood and water, a sign of birth, and what happens? Come on, his bride, Jesus' bride, the church is birthed and brought to him. Come on, you should clap like you got some energy in this place. The Bible says that all that are in the second Adam now shall live in triumph over sin and death. That means that now you're not in the position of sin anymore. You may sin, but there is grace. And grace, my friends, breaks the power of sin. Law does not. Law tells you how bad of a sinner you are. Law will continue to point to you how bad you are. But God's wonderful grace points you to Jesus, points you to the last Adam, points you to your redemption, points you to the one that rescued you, points you to the one that declares you righteous by what he has done. This, my friend, goes against my upbringing of having liking, lighting candles. I have sinned. How have you sinned? Oh, that's 12 Hail Marys. That's 14 Our Fathers. I'm not putting down a church. I'm putting down a belief system that is not biblical. You don't have to serve so that God could accept you here in the church. You don't have to give so that God's happy with you. No, you have to give so I'm happy with you. <laughs> just kidding. Sort of. Watch this now. No, I'm just kidding. So what we do is we say, you know what, God? Look at how I'm worshiping you. I normally don't raise hands, but here I am, Jesus. Yeah. You could sit looking like a bump on the log with a sour puss face on you, just looking... And God doesn't love you more or less. Then why should I worship? Because you should understand the depth of what he has done for you and for me. It's only religious people that just keep trying to go the default system of, oh, look what I have done. Well, pastor, what about pointing people's sin out? The Bible does say that, but it doesn't make them a sinner. It points them out because, listen, the reason why I come to you and say you shouldn't be doing this well, don't judge me. Oh, you, you're taking it out of context. The reason why I'm coming to you and saying, sir, ma'am, I heard what you're doing and what you're living and what you're doing with this situation, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm confronting you on this because it's going to kill you. I'm confronting you on this because you cannot be a teacher and live like this. It's real quiet. You should be grateful for a pastoral team that wants to protect the church. You need to get background checked. Well, I can't believe you're going to do that. Well, you're not going to teach the kids. You could be some pedophile. You're not going to touch my kids or touch anybody else's kids. And if you do, I'm going to touch you. <laughs> well, shouldn't you turn the other cheek? Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm done. Come back to it. Keyboards, I'm done. Simple question for you. Are you in Adam? Are you in Christ? You can't work, earn, to go from one to the other. You know, I'm going to keep saying this probably for the next 25 years. Because the root, I think, of a lot of our issues is because we're performance-based. You know what? One preacher's son that I grew up with, the preacher's son, said, nobody could live up to this standard. He's not even walking with God anymore. The root of his issue is he was trying to perform so that God was okay with him. I don't need to perform. I'm fully accepted, fully loved because of all that Christ has done. If, I'm, if I blow it and I sin against Chip, I'm going to go make it right with Chip. I'm going to go confess my sin to him, one to another, that we can be healed. We take things out of context. What would happen if you lived with righteousness consciousness? What would happen if you just begin to walk like you were in the second Adam? I feel the anointing. You know, in the, in, the, in the second Adam chip, poverty has no dominion over you. In the second Adam, sickness and disease, in, under the second Adam, by his stripes, you are made whole. You know, in the second Adam, there's no generational curses. Then why do I act like the one, like, like my family, it's all crazy? Because you learn habits and patterns, not curses. When you come into the second Adam, every curse has been broken. There is nothing. You just need to believe that. Some of you that are struggling with addictions, I'm just an addict. Quit saying that. If you begin to say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that's who you are. No, that's who you are. Pastor, I'm addicted to pornography. Well, the challenge is, is that pornography has its grip on you. But you can be free. Why do you keep bringing up pornography? Number one, I'm not addicted to it. Okay? Well, pastors that say a lot about stuff that they're... No, no, not... No. Okay? So I'm just making things clear. My wife says, I don't think people understand. So I'm just going to be clear. Check my phone, check whatever, check, it's all good, okay? I'm a man like anybody else. I'm tempted, I'm there, got you. You know, I notice beautiful women, got you, okay? And sometimes I have a man crush. Some guys are just like, ooh, Jesus, he's, he's handsome. <laughs> just being real with you, okay? I'm not saying sexual, I'm just like, ooh, that guy's good looking. It's not fair, Jesus. But I always say, but I got a good personality. <laughs> that personality only gets better with age. That chest will sink. Ha ha ha. I got qualities that wrinkles don't take away from. <laughs> okay. Thirty to forty percent of the men in the church are struggling with pornography. That's a stat that is across the churches in America. And you hate yourself for it. And some of you are quite honestly in bondage to it. But chastising yourself, promising you won't do it again, will not break it. Turning to Jesus will. Getting involved in a group will. It's not an easy thing. I don't even know why I'm going down this road. But pornography addiction, they say fires off the same things in the chemicals in the brain as cocaine does. Scientists are telling us now to, that to break addiction to pornography is almost harder than now drug addiction. Because your brain wants those chemicals released. Your body craves it. There's help for you. There's help for you. It's found in Christ. Condemnation will keep you there. But His grace will pull you out of it. I don't know who I'm talking to, and I'm not going to embarrass you in this place, but I feel the grace of God right now. I'm not judging you. 
I'm not more righteous than you in my own righteousness, but in Christ, all of us are made righteous for those who turn and believe. Do you want to come to this church? you want the 10 laws to live right? I get you one, Jesus. Keep turning to him. Keep looking to him. I grew up in a Baptist church at, at for a season and said, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful grace. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Remember that song, some of you? So very simply today as we close, you're either in Christ or you're in Adam. There's no in-between. There's no purgatory. Pastor Benny Perez, with all his flaws and failures, I'm still in Jesus. And you can declare the same thing if you have turned to Christ. 